Stephen D'Souza, welcome to Altitude. Thank you so much for agreeing to come and speak to us about your second Christmas masterpiece, Die Hard 2. Uh, thank you. And, and after that, that welcome, I, I feel obligated to ask, can I uh, retract my tray table and remove my seatbelt? Yes, and uh, doors are set to manual, so you can leave this interview at any time. All right, um, thank you. Like most people that work in aviation, I'm a huge fan of the movie. Um, it's it's set very much inside of the control tower at Dulles International Airport. Now, did you work with actual air traffic control staff when you were writing that movie, or is that all from your brilliant imagination? Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, thank you for the compliment to my imagination, but uh, indeed, uh, believe it or not, even on my more fantastic movies, um, we had some uh, excellent advisors, and I, we had uh, people from air traffic control, and I took a visit to the uh, air traffic tower here, and uh, uh, I'm flattered and, and astonished to hear that air traffic control has liked this movie because I felt like I took so many liberties that, like, uh, there'd be a picture at every air traffic control of me, and it says, do not cash this man's checks. Right. <laughs> No, no, not at all. It's it's a it's a huge iconic movie for us. We absolutely love it. So the the as as well as writing some of the the massive blockbusters of the eighties and nineties, you're also very famous for how active you are on set, um, often using the locations as characters in your movies. So, did you spend much time at airports during the filming of Die Hard Two? Um, yes, yeah, some of the movie was filmed. Uh, a good deal of the movie was filmed at. Uh... All the terminal scenes, uh, all the interior terminal scenes were filmed uh, here in Los Angeles. Oh, right. Um, and uh, pretending to be uh, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And we had to make, the, like like the shirt you're wearing, Windsor Airlines, we had to make invent, uh, I, I invented that name. We had to sit oh, really? Around Is that you? Yeah, well, we had, to, we had to sit around inventing fake airlines because no real airline would want to, yes. to be uh, in the motion picture. Um, but um, the air traffic control tower in the movie was the complete set. The the only oh, uh, wow. yeah the, the the only uh, uh, actual airport locations uh, were the interiors of you know the, the gift shop, the coffee shop, and the uh, the uh, the terminals where people start running and screaming. Yeah. So so where did you get Windsor Airlines from? Is that just, uh, well, uh, it was you know, looking looking for some kind of uh, name that the lawyers would say would be okay. Uh, <laughs> I this seemed to be like a, an obvious choice. That's all. I, it was it was either that or Camilla Airlines, and you know. <laughs> and I noticed as well that you you chose you chose the British aircraft to crash, in the movie. Is is that is that a dig at the Brits or? No, not at all. I think it it's that. Uh, uh, I, I think probably that uh, American sympathies uh, would have been uh, stronger for the. Uh, uh, the UK airline. We cast the pilot as somebody who was well known from a, a well known a well known actor. Yeah. Um, and also, if we, if I, I forget where the idea came that it had to be. A, a, maybe, I, maybe somebody said the audience will be up. up. There was some site. There's, there's always this uh, kind of psychological second guessing from management. Um, and uh, it's always best when you're in a mad rush and behind schedule because they don't push their like silly ideas too hard. You know, nobody wants to be the executive uh, that gives you a note uh, that makes you like stop production for two days while you repaint. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's quite it's for all for all I know, I'm giving me remember somebody may have said, "Well, don't." I'll tell you two things about Windsor Airlines. One was the if you're going to crash a plane, don't don't crash an American airline because okay. it will right. uh, it, you know we'll probably have problems. With, I don't know if this movie ever shows on an airline. I can't imagine this movie playing on an air, airplane anyway. <laughs> So uh, obviously you want an English-speaking airline for the scene, scene to work. What's funny about this, uh, the, Windsor, the, the, the poor victims of the Windsor crash, um, is, is there an event every year like uh, commemorating them, maybe like Red Poppy Day or something, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but uh, um, I, 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 um, I should say that my, 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 uh, uh, my, uh, my great uncle was uh, uh, in the, uh, in the, um, in the British Army in World War One, uh, but anyway, right. um, uh, the um, we got a note. First of all, the, the it was my idea to, to that that uh, 
Bruce should try and save a plane and fail because right. one of the great compliments I got on the first movie from, you know, peers, people in, in, that, mm. that I work with, they would say, um, wow, that, great movie, Steve. Um, I really thought Bruce was going to die at the end. Uh, and I've heard that from a lot of people. And I thought it was a great compliment because once upon a time, mainstream motion pictures, American movies, certainly, the hero could win but die. Paul Newman, you know, it's not yes. just Sean Bean. Yes. Sean Bean does not have a monopoly yes. on dying in movies. Uh, uh, but uh, like Paul Newman, would, in many of his movies, would win, but he would die. Yes. Uh, Frank Sinatra, uh, trivia question, you know, was in the first, was in the prequel to Die Hard. I've covered that in your story. Do you know that? Okay. You know, you know the Sinatra connection to Die Hard? No, no. no right, we'll all... come back to that. But anyway, Sinatra was in the movie uh, Von Ryan's Express. Mm -hmm. where he uh, helps a prisoners of war escape from a German prison war camp, but he dies as they escape. So okay. um, the fact that Bruce seems so vulnerable and so human in Die Hard, which was an antidote to the uh, kind of steroid-ripped heroes yes. that I also was responsible for in the 80s, that was a great compliment. And he also suffered mightily, you know, yes. and was guilt-ridden and all these things. So now when you do a sequel, you're saying, okay, we're doing a sequel, you're pretty sure he won't die in this movie. How do you get that vulnerability back? So that's yes. where the idea came from, okay. that, that uh, he should try and rescue, uh, uh, rescue a plane. So anyway, when you turn the script into the studio, the first thing you'll appreciate as an air traffic controller is as the budget of the movie started to grow, as I was typing, uh, Joel Silver, our producer, calls me up and says, listen, you're going to hate me for this, uh, but the, 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 uh, the, the suits... Uh, are desperate trying to get the budget down. They have this brilliant idea that the movie, sh to save money, the movie should not be in Washington, D.C., that it should be in Los Angeles, and the problem is heavy fog. Okay. So oh, I need you save to... on the snow, then. Uh, yeah, yeah, and the travel. So can you do a draft where it's heavy fog? And I said, look, you know, I, I'm not a weatherman, but I, I don't think fog lasts for, like, 12 hours. <laughs> And it also was only in low line, you know, and it, and there's like, and there's so many, air, there's airports like in driving distance from here. Yes, yes. I, it, it says, I know, I already talked, they want to see it. So I had to do, I don't know what I would have done uh, 20 years, uh, 10 years prior, but thanks to Global Search and Replace, it really wasn't that difficult. The only rewriting I had to do was, uh, um, uh, I guess in the scene where the the uh, the, the the plane with the general lands, yes, um, and uh, I had to sort of like actually go in as a human, and I couldn't use global search, search and replace. I had to, so I spent like you know a day and a half on this like pointless exercise. And of course, when they read it, they go, "Oh, this doesn't work." And they go, "Okay, we have one other note. We're afraid that when the uh, Windsor plane crashes, that the audience will be so disturbed by all those innocent people getting killed." that we may lose the audience. People may faint, wow. they may walk out, you know? So can you do an alternate version where it's a cargo plane? Oh, so right. we can say, well, the pilot and co-pilot were killed. Yeah. And a lot of people are, and a lot of people won't be getting their Christmas presents. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of like, I guess about uh, 12 or 13 years prior to, uh, um, what, what's that uh, movie with Tom Hanks where he's on a UPS plane and crashes? Uh, that is um, Castaway. Yeah, so before Castaway, we, we were going to do that. So we actually spent money and filmed, you know, this is, there's only one CGI shot. There's only two CGI sh shots in the movie. The very oh. end of the movie, all the planes are on the runway. Yes. And when Bruce shoots up in the um, uh, ejection seat. Oh, the seat, ejection seat, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, but the airplanes, which are the convincing crashes, they were like huge models. I mean, wow. uh, w wider than my arm span here. And I'm six foot tall, just for, for yeah. reference, you know, in, case someone, uh, in case someone thinks I'm like, let's say the height of <coughs> Tom Cruise. But anyway, <laughs> the airplane, the airplane is, was, was, was this big. Um, so we actually filmed that. So once they said, uh, once they, they said, okay, hold that. And we have the first test screening. And if people fill out their cards or, or like start walking out of the theater, we're going to plug in the, the plane crash of the uh, UPS, pardon me, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. NPS, National, NPS, it's another one, no. National Park, Park, another one we made up, and yeah. we'll, use the, we'll use the take uh, where um, the air traffic controller says, well, the pilot and co-pilot confirmed dead, you know. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So anyway, we tested the movie, 
And as, of course, you could have predicted, the audience did not hate us, the filmmakers. Yeah. They hated the villains even more. Yes. And, but now, now that I knew that, I made sure that we used all the footage. I put There was even more footage of that adorable little girl. On yes. the plane, yes, and all the joke, all the joke. I did all. I, I just loaded the, the the scene on the airplane. All oh, right, with enough dialogue to convince you they were going to make it. Yes, the little old lady. Yes, my story yes. says what she said. Did she say, did she say mind the gap or something? Or yeah. there was there was I, I I I was I did that to totally like you know like mess up the audience. Of yes, course, well, you're you, make it. You say you said we're just like British Rail. We may be late, but we get you there in the end. Oh, 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 that's, that's the line. Right. That's, that's the line. All right, that's great. So, uh, and in fact, um, and there was a little, there was a little more conversation with the little girl, and the stewardess yes. put a seatbelt on the teddy bear. Yes. And 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 somebody decided that was too much. It was, okay. and that was that was too hard. That was too heartbreaking for the audience. <laughs> but you'll notice that Bruce finds the burnt teddy bear on, on <laughs> yes, the ground. Yes, he did. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. So, by the way, by the way, that, that for for a while. And maybe it's still standing. That crash gave me the record for the most people killed in a movie. Really? You know, there were articles saying now uh, the, the uh, and they would say the number of people killed in Rambo, uh, yeah. then Commando, and then um, and and every time I see these articles, which still appear, I go, "What the hell, Star Wars? <laughs> How many? Like what? Like four, five billion people on on, on Alderaan? But they <laughs> keep coming back to these movies to make a point, you know? Yeah. So uh, some some of the stuff that you, you you write in there, some of the the technical phraseology, you know, the the ILS, the instrument landing system, yeah. all of that stuff is is real stuff. So how important to you is it is, is to get that technical detail, or is it not really that important for a wider audience? Well, I think it's very important for you to believe in the uh, problems uh, and the solutions that, that the characters have. Uh, and in the uh, professionalism of the people we meet in the movie. So in the case of this movie, for all of those reasons, we I did as much research as possible, taking the liberties I would have to take you know, for, for the fictional story. But to give you an example, if this were, um, um, I mentioned earlier, Star Wars, mm. you know, there's a lot of meaningless technical dialogue yes. in a movie like Star Wars to make it sound like the people know what they're doing. Yes. You know? And uh, even though the terms are are in people don't know it, uh, they'll say, uh, ah, mine axe, they're chewing on the power coupling. Get out there, chew it. You're like, we don't know what a mine axe is, you know, but, or he says, how do I, oh, you look, you look, look, listen, you nerf herder. Like, what does that mean? But the the audience, I guess I've seen that movie too many times. Well, now you know I don't sit around just watching my own movies, like Miss Harrison in in Great Expectations. Yeah. Um, So, uh, if even in the fictional story, you'd make up some technical stuff uh, uh, in order to raise a problem and solve it. And in this movie, uh, we try to be factual. And then, remember, they go out looking for, uh, uh, I guess, the outer marker cable or something. Yes, I forget that's what, what, right. What, 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 yeah. So once I, once I learned some factual things from our advisors, then I figured, what can go wrong? Mm-hmm. And how do we remedy that? So the sequence where... Um, uh, uh, the colonel deliberately crashes the plane by changing the indicator of ground level. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know whether that could actually be done, but if it could actually be done, supposedly that would, you know, uh, that would work. Uh, the um, idea that they can hijack uh, the beacon uh, yes. to do voice transmissions, yes. that might be a stretch. I don't know if that's plausible, but in movie terms, it seems uh, plausible. E- e- easily in movies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And 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 uh, uh, I guess it was convincing enough. And I, I, the only thing I saw some of the critics in the movie, uh, he, yeah, the movie uh, uh, were saying, well, couldn't they go to other airports? But there was a lot of dialogue that the snowstorm was all up and down the East Coast. It was, and uh, yes. and unfortunately, the the, it, the weather front had changed, and now it's too late to send them to other airports. So that was yes. well, we, that was sort of like um, uh, a, a paving. Uh, doing a, a McAdam paving over the over the potholes in the story. Yes, um, yes. But I think a lot of people don't hear some of that dialogue. And there's a wonderful essay, uh, a video essay. Um, actually, I, I just I just called out. Uh, this, this is my fourth year uh, writing for Sight and Sound. I guess they want one popcorn movie maker like contributing to Sight and Sound. 
Yeah. So uh, at the end of the year, they do a uh, they have they have uh, a number of people, uh, uh, critics and filmmakers, uh, write up what they think are the most interesting critical essays on video, video essays about the filmmaking process. And there's one that I picked, which is why are modern movies so hard to understand, mm -hmm. starting with, with 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 Christopher Nolan, that you're like, what did he say? What was that? You know, uh, and um, it's if if you can. We'll look for it. It'll, it'll be, I think, next month in Sight and Sound. It'll be online. Um, this essay, not me, points out what is absolutely true. is as you're making the movie, right, and you're trying to, let's get more sound effects. Can mm -hmm. that gunshot be louder? I want to hear the music more. And you're doing this and you have all, yeah. you know, you, you, you're working in audio right now. You're trying to balance the tracks. Mm -hmm. You, the filmmakers, you have the movie memorized. Because you, you, this is like the 35th time you've done that reel, you know? Yes. So what happens, you sort of have memorized the dialogue. Mm -hmm. So you don't realize you've completely buried the line. Uh, Chewy, the mine acts are chewing on the power coupling. You better get outside and all the sound effects. And then the audience wonders, why are they getting out of the spaceship? You know. So um, I think that's probably what happened here is with all of the noise and commotion that a lot of people miss the, uh, the uh, scotch tape and glue that I... Uh, uh, patched up all the holes with. It was a, it was a perfect job, a perfect job. So y y you're also known as the father of the zinger, the big powerful one liner, and the immortal line, "Stack and pack em and rack em," delivered by the late great Fred Thompson, is still iconic to anybody that works in air traffic control. Where did that line come from? Well, what's crazy is a lot of people uh, think that that's some kind of real, like, air traffic control jargon. And from <laughs> what you're saying, maybe it has become such. I don't know. Have, have, you, have people actually said that when things back up? Uh, never. But occasionally, just in the control tower with a, with a mug of coffee, it is, it is heard in the background by somebody. All right. Well, I just made that up because it sounded cool. It's amazing. And, and, and it, it, fit Fred, it fit Fred's... Uh, uh, it fits Fred's personality. By the way, he was a very interesting guy. Um, uh, uh, what is your what is your rating? If this were a movie, what is the rating of this conversation? Well, well, we we can we can we can cut and slice anything, so you can say what you want. Uh, all right, okay. So you, you'll beat me out anyway. Uh, I'm in my office one day, and Fred Thompson comes in, knocks on my door, and I'm you know surprised to see him. Uh, I say, can I can I help you? And he goes, um, uh, yes, yeah, Steve. Uh, I want to talk to you about. Uh, uh, a lot of the cursing in this movie. Well, there are there are sixty three f words. Yes, I know. So I said, uh, Mr. Thompson, look, this is an R rated movie, and um, I know you're a Republican, but he says, let me stop you there, young fella. I was in the Marines, and you won't believe that the sh heard, and as bad or worse in Congress. But, and I quite understand why you got some of this salty language in this script. But back on the set, a lot of the actors, particularly <coughs> Bruce Willis, are getting a little carried away with this. Okay. So you may have somebody say once, now it's there 10 times. Yeah. So why don't you come down to the set and watch a take, and then you might want to get your eraser out and maybe cut down on the number of because as many as you put in, they're adding them. So I go to the set, and sure enough, everybody, it's like, you know, where's my coffee? <laughs> time they're like, like they, they were like completely out of control. So I recently went back, and I actually took out, I think, all of the except maybe, all, all of, except, I think I left eight. I left, wow. and, and there's still, there's still, still like 10 times that many. Unbelievable. So the actors have just got free license to just pepper them in as they see fit. Well, it became a key and ask me macho or something. I don't know what happened. It just sort of like ran rampant. Incredible. So, uh, I mean, you must have been delighted to be asked to come back to do the sequel after the success of Die Hard only, you know, a year and a half before. Oh, yeah, it was uh, really great. I, I actually think that the decision to make the sequel was li literally made like Monday or Tuesday after the movie opened. Really? Uh, and in order to facilitate it that quickly, the first thing they did was they said, write a, write a trailer. Right. 
So I wrote a trailer with one line of dialogue. How does the same thing happen to the same guy twice? Yes. And we went to a location that was a, I think a, um, uh, a water filtration plant that was, uh, uh, had been, that was either like out of service because it was being modernized or something, had long tunnels. And we filmed that trailer there that was a completely separate production. It was not seen for the movie. It was filmed months before we filmed the movie. Um, and uh, that's, and that was in theaters like that December, the, that, that was in theaters like it was, I guess, um, what, what the, the summer after Die Hard, Die Hard came out, I think, uh, in the uh, in the summer, mm -hmm. I think, in July, yeah. I can't Almost remember. July. Yeah, so I think that, I think that um, Coming Attraction was in theaters, like, uh, the, for, before the, by next summer, I think, I can't remember wow. exactly. It was incredible, incredibly, uh, incredibly fast. And in order to get the movie out quickly, there was another script uh, that was based on a, on a novel called 58 Minutes. It had nothing to do with any of these characters at all. Yeah. And that was the boat, that was the, uh, the skeleton that I built this script on top of. It's quite different from the book. Awesome. Yeah. And just, just like I was concerned that somewhere the air traffic controllers, like, like uh, uh, I'm on a list, uh, to my surprise, the fellow who wrote the novel that I kind of like, you know, totally remodeled, he wrote an editorial about how much he liked the movie. Oh, and he really? totally understood, yeah, and he totally understood that are the changes that were made to make it fit into the diehard pattern. So that, yeah. that was nice. Because was that, what was the original premise of the story then? Was it a guy stuck at an airport with his wife circling in fog? No, there was, there, there, was, there was a totally different character. He was actually oh. the head of airport. The hero was the head, head of airport security. Right. Uh, and and, and the, um, the, the, the bad guys were uh, Arab terrorists. I cannot tell you, I spent half my career like removing Arab terrorists from movies where it makes absolutely no sense. He says, like, uh, uh, there's, there's hostages in the bank. Well, why? Arab terrorists. You know, like, uh, there's a hold, there's, there's a hold up in the Bronx. Why? Arab terrorists. You're like, well, what is, you know, you know, so uh, it's sort of the go-to for lazy writers. So, uh, right. I, and, I, hence, I've yet the, to, hence the creation of a completely new country. Uh, exactly. Well, that, exactly. Uh, you create, you create the fictional country because if you, you know, if you say, listen, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, um, the, the, um, the, uh, Ambassador from uh, um, uh, Barbados is actually smuggling drugs, and now you've got a lawsuit. You know, yes. so um, we've got. I made up a lot of countries uh, over over my time. Val Verde really caught on mm -hmm. um, in a big way. Uh, and in fact, there's an article. I could, if you have a website, I'll send you a link to this article that Forbes magazine wrote. It said the multi-billion-dollar movie franchise you've never heard of, <laughs> and they have like a chart, like almost like a like a. It's always sunny in Philadelphia, like a chart, a graph of how, because of all different connections, the Valverde, the Valverde film universe now includes like 24 movies and is like billions of dollars. And they explain how all the alien movies fit into the Valverde movie because Valverde is the movie in Predator because Joel Silver recycles the thing. Yes. And uh, um, Speed is also now in the Valverde universe wow. because John DeBont, as an inside joke, put the name on the truck a Pacific Courier that's in, so there's a whole whole thing. Oh, yeah. incredible. My other country that doesn't, that doesn't get in traction anymore, but maybe now if the Cold War is heating up, is that an oxymoron? If the Cold War is coming back now, which it seems to be this week, my other, uh, my, my Eastern Bloc country, Litvania. I may, I use that in television a lot, Litvania. Got it. Sounds real. Yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of a play on a few countries in one way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clever. So, it, it, but setting this at an airport, as a writer, do you think that there's something about airports that lend themselves to really good drama? Well, so many people have like flown and flying, especially nowadays, is so fraught with drama. It used to just be, are we going to get there on time? Were our plane be canceled? Are the kids going to act up? And now there's so much more. Is there going to be somebody on my plane having a conniption fit? You know, or is it going to, am, am I going to help? Well, I'd be called upon to. They, I know they they used to say uh, uh, it, we we need someone who is like healthy and fit to be in the uh, yeah. um, in the exit aisle. Now they say, is anybody here uh, healthy and fit enough to help us do another passenger with duct tape? <laughs> you know, it, it's the new probably the new boarding pass thing. So I I think you have an automatic um, uh, head start on anxiety, yeah. or certainly familiarity. Uh, uh, anyway, airport everybody's been there. 
they sort of understand how it operates uh, to a certain degree. Um, although, trust me, the the luggage, the, the robotic luggage area, is not, I don't think it really looks like that. Yeah, well, yeah, we, we do love the scene where, where Bruce goes chasing the bad guys through the baggage facility. And, and this baggage facility has got, has got steam vents all over it. I, 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 <laughs> I don't know why that is. And the other thing is, is that the first terrorist to be killed is actually shoved through a set of rollers. And we're, we're trying to figure out why, why, there's a, why there's a machine that just seems to squash bags. Well, that's because, uh, you know, automation, we don't have to rely upon the baggage handler to crush the bags anymore. <laughs> so we know that you're a, a big believer that, uh, that Die Hard is definitely a Christmas movie. But what about Die Hard 2? It's obviously still Christmas Eve, and we've got Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow at the end. But do you think it, it ticks the boxes? Well, I, I, I would say that it, it probably ticks almost as many boxes. Uh, I think that Die Hard just got all the attention because it started becoming this perennial that, uh, uh, that plays on television all the time. Uh, and so that started the great debate. But I think you're quite right. Die Hard 2 is, uh, you know, I'd have to get up my calipers and my, uh, my, my red tape and my, my is it sunny in Philadelphia chart? You know, my, my, my uh, psycho killer chart, uh, the opening uh, seven, like the opening credits of seven. But uh, I think it probably checks all the boxes. Uh, every year, um, there's this uh, burst of, you know, debate. Uh, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? And I get, I have my moment of fame. Uh, there's a feature on IMDb that uh, I guess tracks how often you're mentioned in media, just in general. So, like, if I look up Ariane Grande, like, it's like up here to spike, yeah. right? Because in any given week, but now she's getting attention for a very interesting and funny role playing a, a parody of herself in this mm -hmm. new movie, Don't Look Up, which you were probably, uh, which uh, is not about air traffic control, yeah. actually. <laughs> but um, but uh, I do notice that I'm kind of like a flat line. You know, I mean, anybody behind the camera is just like a, a maybe Sp maybe Spielberg's higher, but, uh, you know, but um, but every Christmas, if you look at my 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 my, my EEG chart, chart of yeah. when, when my name appears in print, uh, every December, I have a spike. And I <laughs> dropped down to obscure. I dropped down to obscurity. Anyway, a couple of years ago, I guess it was the um, um, AFI or uh, no, the American Cinema Cinematheque asked me to uh, introduce Die Hard uh, mm -hmm. for Christmas, and I knew that someone in the audience would ask the question, so I had a chart made up uh, comparing White Christmas to Die Hard, and I said certainly we can all agree that White Christmas is a Christmas movie. Do we all agree? Not everyone. Okay. Now look at this handy chart, and I prove empirically that Die Hard is even more Christmassy than um, White Christmas. And I will share that chart with you. You can put it on your website. And Fantastic. I'll immediately, when I get off this call, start working on a new chart for Die Hard 2. <laughs> Stephen D'Souza, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you about our favorite film. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you have a final message to all of the NAT staff, and indeed all air traffic control staff all around the world this Christmas time. Uh, yes, as you gather around uh, your trees for celebration and you uh, take the, the, the presents out of hiding and bring them out, um, stack them, pack them, and rack them. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Bye-bye.